spiritual practice based on her pilgrimage. Um, I urge you to read her biography on our flyer, which you could take with you, and they're right on the settee on the way out the door, and you might want to post that at your meeting or your congregation or wherever friends gather. Um, she's had quite a spiritual pilgrimage, and um, the work that she did um, demonstrates the degree to which she has applied her artistic talents to a spiritual journey um, as a pilgrimage along the Compostela de Santiago on several different occasions. Um, this evening, however, we're very delighted to have with us uh, the Reverend Pastor John R. Norwood. And I'm going to have to use my cheat sheet because some of his titles are longer than others, and I don't want to botch that. He is the Principal Justice of the Tribal Supreme Court of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation, and for which he has also served as a councilman for over a decade. He's also the co-chair of the Task Force on Federal Acknowledgement of the National Congress of American Indians and the General Secretary of the Alliance of Colonial Era Tribes. Dr. Norwood is the senior minister to the Nanticoke Lenape Tribal Christian Prayer Circle Ministry and has served for over 20 years as the pastor of the Ujima Village Christian Church of Ewing, New Jersey a non-tribal urban congregation. He's represented his tribe at the national and international level and has written about and lectured on tribal history, culture, and current concerns. And um, some of us know him from a long, for a long time in the area, folks from the Philadelphia Early Meeting Indian Affairs Committee, some of us, Paula among them, met, met um, Dr. Norwood um, as he was part of the delegation that was attempting to uh, reach out to Pope Francis to have the doctrine of discovery repudiated by the Catholic Church, um, including folks from Guatemala and other parts of um, North and Central America. Uh, and some of us had the privilege of hearing him lecture on the doctrine of discovery and the shady and shameful past of Christopher Columbus and the putting it to place Christopher Columbus Day um, and how, how might we remove that ignominy or, or remember that day in a different way. So I won't delay. This evening, um, uh, Dr. Norwood is going to be speaking to us about the Lenape tradition in this area on the very land that we are currently occupying was Lenape land. Um, it was part of William Penn's charter, um, which is another element of our combined past history, and um, although many of the Lenape were either extinguished, um, they were certainly moved from this land and now are spread from the Midwest down into Oklahoma, but there are still uh, Lenape in the area doing their tribal traditions and carrying on as a nation today. So we're going to hear a little bit about the past, but also about where are the Lenape today and what is their situation. Thank you so much for being with us, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank the invitation for Mr. Mayor to come out and speak with you. We began talking about this, oh, maybe three months ago and have been in continual communication. I've been looking forward to it. It's good to see my friends from both the PYM and the uh, SQ, yeah, <laughs> Quarterly, <laughs> Indian Committee who's working with us. 
and I uh, want to uh, introduce my wife who's sitting next to our new friend Paula. This is Tanya Norwood and anything that's good about me you can credit to her and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to greet you in my traditional language. Ita kwango mamohemo deluensi kelek petamok hake nantekok oklam nape. I'm both Nanticoke and Lenape, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is and what the combination is. Uh, and uh, at the end of my lecture, I'm hoping that we can have a dialogue, ask some questions, make some statements, let me know what you think, inform me about some things that I may not be aware of. If we could move uh, on into the next one, the title is still here, the Lenape today. One of the things that I always like to remind people of is that when we talk about Native America, American Indians, the indigenous people of this land, uh, we are not all the same. It would be the equivalent of trying to suggest that a person who is from Portugal is uh, celebrating the same culture, speaks the same way, has the same understandings of the land around them as someone who might be, let's say, from Scandinavia. Uh, we, there are different regions. Each region has a different cultural backdrop, has different traditions, different tribal nations. Um, we never all look the same. And while there are a lot of common values and principles that tend to run uh, across any country, across North America, uh, there are very many differences. Next slide. One of the things that I ask people to be aware of whenever they begin to talk about American Indians are some statements that typically wind up landing people into trouble, and into error. And that is the statement, all American Indians believe. I can tell you, after dealing at the national level with tribal leaders from across the country, we don't agree on a lot of things. Things that you would think we would agree on, we debate and we struggle over issues and try and reach consensus. We tend to be a little more successful than the Congress is these days, but we do have a lot of differences. That's setting the bar very high. You know, if, we can, if we can beat Congress, we figure we're doing okay. You know. um, but not all tribes or individual American Indians have identical beliefs. The belief system, spiritual belief systems, even political setups and relationships between families vary from tribe to tribe, from region to region. So anyone who would say all American Indians believe or think or do, uh, they're starting off in the midst of error. Uh, and let me just clarify, I use the term American Indian, and part of the reason that I do that, uh, because people have a lot of different opinions about this, and if you speak to tribal people, a lot of tribal people have different opinions about this. Uh, people have said, well, don't you want to be called Native American? Matter of fact, I've had defenders jump in, and uh, when someone asks about American Indians, and someone who's a non-Indian will think they're defending me and say, oh, well, they don't refer to themselves as that. But yeah, we do. Uh, quite a few of us do. And there's a reason for that. The terms Native American, American Indian, Indigenous American, First Nations people, uh, a lot of us will use those terms interchangeably. If you look at the older national intertribal organizations, and even some of the newer institutions set up by those intertribal organizations, you'll see the term American Indian used. And people ask, you know, why would you do that? That was based on an error from Columbus who didn't even know where he was when he got here. And uh, that may indeed be the case, but what we have to remember is our treaties use that term. A lot of the agreements, the land agreements, the compacts use that term. So it ties us in with the legal promises that were made to our people. And to abandon it, you know, because people are always trying to tell us that they didn't make an agreement. So we don't want to give them another reason to say that it no longer includes us. One of the major reasons that I find is because the legal language in the United States, the laws of the federal government that, that do impact our people have used that term going all the way back. And so that is part of the reason you'll find so many national organizations still saying American Indian, differentiated from Indian American, who is someone with an ancestry from the subcontinent of India. Uh, there are certainly common held beliefs and principles that a lot of tribes share, but a lot of differences. And because of this, there are a lot of misconceptions. And there's confusion. 
and there's a lack of understanding about the differences in history that have impacted our people because the history here on the East Coast in regard to contact and colonialism is very different from the, hist the history out in the Midwest. And that history is significant and it impacts how we uh, engage the uh, governments around us, how we are depicted sometimes historically, and we'll talk a little about that. Next slide. Some of the common practices, just so you are aware that we do have a few things in common. Uh, one is smudging. Some of you may be aware of this. I know that those of you who have come to worship uh, at our prayer meeting are very much aware of this. You'll see at many public ga gatherings, and sometimes if you're watching a movie that depicts anything accurately, you'll see Indians wafting smoke. They'll be burning something and smoke wafting up. Sometimes they'll fan it with their hands. Sometimes they'll use a prayer feather. And that's medicine. Typically, it is cedar, sage, sweet grass, tobacco, sometimes pine. And it is a way of blessing. It is a way of purifying. Uh, I like to explain to people it's the equivalent of, of incense that you see in a lot of uh, religious settings. And it's the natural incense that we have. It's what the Creator gave us, and we burn it as an offering. It's rising represents our prayers, going up to the Creator. The, the aroma represents a purification based on which medicine you happen to use. And uh, you know, you'll be at some events, and one Indian will tell you that this medicine means this, and you'll be, go across the way and you'll find an Indian from a different tribe saying, no, it means that. And guess what? They're both right based on their tribal traditions because tribes had different perspectives. Uh, the pipe is something that is used. How it's used varies from tribe to tribe. There are some tribes that have a high pipe tradition, if you want to put it that way, where there are designated pipe carriers and you have to go through certain ceremonies to hold a pipe and to conduct the ceremony. And then there are other tribes where anybody can do it. Uh, and, but, but the understanding of the significance of the pipe is fairly common. And, and that, that is that it is very similar to smudging. It's, a, it's something that, you, that people will do not only recreationally, but primarily as a, a ritual, a personal ritual, as a prayer ceremony. Uh, we pass the pipe even today when significant things are happening, when we are uh, in the election of a new chief, when we're in the midst of a prayer session when we're seeking guidance, when we're coming together to agree. Uh, the non-Indians used to call it a peace pipe because whenever there was a treaty that was cut in the early days, we would smoke the pipe together. It was a way of symbolizing not only our prayers for whatever was going to happen, that we would be guided by the Creator, but also that whatever was stated would be a firm promise, like you were speaking to the Creator. A sweat lodge is something that is fairly common across North America. And it is shaped in different ways based on where you are, and the ceremonies vary. There is no one sweat lodge ceremony. But the use of the lodge for personal purification, for hygienic purposes, for healing purposes, for sacred ritual, uh, is something that's fairly common across North America. Next slide. Are you turned on? I, am I turned on? Yes. OK, yes. OK. Yes. All right. I can't tell from that you. is an interesting question. I you might want to edit that out. <laughs> Jeremy, you might want to edit that out. Okay. <laughs> you could take that anywhere on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> More common traditional practices also include drumming. However, the style of drumming, the type of drum, the way it's used, who can handle it, changes from tribe to tribe. What you see upper in, uh, in the upper right-hand corner is actually a water drum. That would be very common to this area, this region known as Lenape Hooking. Uh, and many of northeastern woodland tribes would have used this. It's, uh, they come in various sizes, and uh, after contact, uh, contact there were, there were um, kettle pots that also were used with a, with a uh, skin stretched over it, and they were tied in a particular way. Uh, that drum is actually a more ancient style of drum that's made out of wood. They used to sometimes even be made right out of a log or, or tree branch. And water was actually put in it, and the, and the level of water would change the tone of the drum. We still use these today. And the amount of water you put in, the tightness of the skin over it, the size of the drum, changes the pitch. Uh, what you see immediately under it is a hand drum. And there are different styles. Some you hold from behind, some have two heads, you know, two skins, one on either side. Some are open on the back, some you hold at the top. And it varies by region. 
and these are, were used as personal drums. Sometimes they were used uh, by, by both men and by women. Uh, the, 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 there were, were various ways that people would utilize them for either personal singing, family singing, or tribal purposes. The large drum that you see all of the, or two drums that you see all of the men around in the slide right next to that, that is the war drum, sometimes also called a powwow drum. That drum is not indigenous to this area. It came to us from the West, and it has become very common to see American Indians uh, at their social gatherings and powwows using this war drum. Um, it is something that connects us to the rest of the Indians in North America because whenever there's a power, you're going to see them pull out this war drum. It became very, very popular because so many can sit around it and in a, in a, in a group and sing and beat the drum with the same rhythm at the same time. It's also very loud. If you've ever been to a powwow, you can hear and actually feel the vibrations of that large drum moving right through you. Uh, so it, became, it was, became quite popular quite rapidly here on the East Coast. Medicine bags, pouches um, are, are pretty common. They are items that are used for personal significance, mementos, items of spiritual significance are placed within them. Sometimes some of the medicine that I had mentioned earlier and they are carried and they are meaningful to the individual. It is um, poor form to reach out and touch a medicine bag and say, oh, this is beautiful, grab it. Uh, Indians will draw back. They might slap your hand away because that's not something that is done. Uh, looking at it is fine, asking to see it a little closer. Sometimes, if you ask, they'll lift it up and they'll show it to you. But typically, that's something that is extremely personal. And it is almost, the mementos that are put in it, sometimes almost form like a prayer journal, that the things are in it are significant. Sometimes what's in it uh, represents healing that you're praying to have or praying for someone. Uh, my wife has an interesting explanation for her, her bag. Do you mind if I share that? She says that the medicine in her bag are prayers and that as she prays, she holds the bag and sometimes will put a little strip in it because she wants to remember what she prayed for and what the creator's response was. So she's always looking for those responses. Uh, the eagle is significant. Uh, in some uh, tribal cultures, it is far more significant than others. Uh, others, the turkey actually is the, has an equivalent or superior significance to the eagle. But uh, the eagle is typically seen as uh, a messenger to heavens. The feathers are a sign of honor and bravery. It's something that you earn. Uh, which is why it's actually quite offensive when mascots are running around with these eagle feathers all over the place because it is something that is significant that is earned. Sometimes feathers are passed down through families. Um, and it, the reason that the eagle is viewed as significant by many tribal cultures is because it flies so high and is viewed as flying high close to the realm of the creator. The observance of the four directions, even though some of the uh, symbols of the directions will vary from tribe to tribe. The colors will vary from tribe to tribe. Most have some observance of the four directions and will often in ceremonies orient themselves to the four directions in the midst of a ceremony. Honor gifts are extremely common. And that is where you bestow someone with some symbol of your gratitude, some symbol of your esteem. You honor them. Uh, in the lower right hand corner, you see uh, the man in the middle is being honored by being given a blanket. The blanket's being put around his shoulders. Uh, and sometimes honor gifts are given privately, and sometimes they're given publicly. This happened to be a public display. Next slide. Another thing that is extremely, that is extremely common is our relationship to the land, the tie we have to the earth. Those who remain and, and maintain those traditional values view the earth as something that is living. You'll, you'll hear American Indians here in North America, and when I say North America, even up into Canada, refer to uh, this continent as Turtle Island. And that's, that's a very common reference. Here, the reason for the reference stems back to our creation story. 
and it, it refers to the fact that the land itself was viewed as being on the back of a great turtle. For the Lenape, it was a box turtle. And uh, while our people don't necessarily believe that literally, the, the, the tradition and the understanding is still significant to us. It reminds us that the land is alive, and it has to be respected as being alive. Next slide, please. Our relationships with other creatures uh, is rather significant. Uh, one of the things my chief likes to say is there's a particular bird that when he uh, is needing some spiritual uplift, some confirmation over a prayer, it seems that the Creator will send a red-tailed hawk his way. And it will light on something and oftentimes will stare right down at him. There is this deep relationship that we feel we are connected to all other created things and that the animals are actually part of our extended family. And there are those who have suggested that this is very different from Christianity. Well, it may be different from some Christian traditions, but it certainly is not different from Christianity because indeed, as we look to the creation story itself, we see that we are connected to all other things. When we hunted, we made sure that uh, nothing was wasted. There was no, at least among our folks, there was no sport hunting just for trophies. Uh, the, the animals that would be the, what we would use for our food also were the animal skins that we used for our clothing, also were the bones and the hooves that we used to make tools and other implements. And it was thought that if you wasted any of that, creature, you were dishonoring it. You were doing violence. You were disobeying the will of the Creator. In fact, one of the reasons so many of the missionaries assumed that we prayed to dead animals was because when one of our hunters takes an animal, and this happens even today, they will offer tobacco, they will pray over the animal, they will mourn the loss of that life. They will thank the Creator and the animal for the life and understand that in order to honor the purpose of that hunt, all of that animal had to be used. Next slide, please. Now we're going to get into the continuing folk that are here, those that are uh, indigenous and have remained in this region of the country. Next slide. The grandfathers and the Tidewater people. On the right you have New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, a little bit of Maryland, and that lightly colored area is the land of the Lenape, which has come to be known as Lenape poking, which is actually a, a term that was coined in modern times, but very probably was also used in ancient times, even though we don't have any direct reference of that particular term, but it means land of the Lenape. And it extended from the headwaters of the Hudson in southeastern uh, New York, included a bit of western, Pen uh, western Connecticut, uh, part of the, uh, the island of, of, of uh, New York, the island of Manhattan, it came, came down to Delaware, eastern Pennsylvania, all of New Jersey, which we call Cheyenne, uh, by the water's edge, New Jersey surrounded by water on three sides, and into Delaware, all the way down into southern Delaware. Um, and that area is subdivided between different subtribes, but it was all part of the Lenape homeland, and we view it as still being the Lenape homeland. The Nanticoke people, which were to the south, originally down by uh, the Chesapeake Bay along the eastern shore and extending into southern Delaware, uh, eventually wound up occupying the whole of the central part of the Delmarva Peninsula and became the dominant tribe there uh, just prior to and during the early part of the colonial era. Today, our Nanticoke relatives are headquartered in southern Delaware, uh, but are, and as you will see, are part of a confederation that extends up into New Jersey. The Lenny Lenape, uh, the reason we put Lenny in front of Lenape is it's a reduplication. Lenape essentially means the original people or the real people. When you put Lenny in front of it, it's saying, you know, the really real people. And part of that is because uh, the the Lenape were viewed as the ancient uh, origin for many of the northeastern tribes. If you speak to Algonquian speaking tribes, uh, many of them retain the memory that the Lenape were their ancient ancestors. 
And the League of the Lenape included uh, about 20-some tribes uh, in, uh, along the eastern seaboard and up into the northeastern states uh, that are there today. The, it was an interesting story as I was traveling um, and we, I met a, an Ottawa chief uh, who today has become a very dear friend, and, but this was the first time I had met him. And I had my little name tag on at this national event and it said the tribal origin. He looked at it. And this gentleman, you know, if he sees this, forgive me, but he's probably about old enough to be my father. He may not admit it, but I, he's probably about old enough to be my father. And he said, mm, you're one of the ancient ones. I had no idea that the Ottawa, his tribe is way out in Michigan now, uh, acknowledged that we were the grandfathers or the ancient ones. The Nanticoke, also known as the Tidewater people, um, originated along the eastern shore of the Delmarva Peninsula, the Chesapeake Bay area, and they, uh, the, in ancient times, were known as bridge builders. They were the makers of a form of wampum, which is a shell bead known as uh, 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 wampum peak. They, they, they um, made belts woven out of that, similar to the way that, that uh, the Quahog wampum is used a little further north where the people that made those beautiful belts. One will be displayed in this, uh, in this slideshow. And the Nanako originated from among the Lenape uh, even more recently than many of the other tribes that still do call the Lenape the ancient ones. Uh, they, there's an old story of the Nanticoke uh, moving further southward, actually being um, from the Mount Lenape, moving further southward, looking for more areas to hunt and, and to, to settle, and uh, more or less forming their own tribal uh, community. Next slide. Now, early on, our, our people had a tradition of obligatory hospitality. Anyone who came into the region, so long as they respected our ways and our primacy over our lands, we had to take care of them. We had to welcome them. In some instances, they wound up, while they were still getting on their feet, staying right in the chief's own home. Uh, they were fed like honored guests. They were cared for, they were looked after. That was an ancient tradition. And when the first Europeans arrived and wanted to stay a while, that was the ancient tradition. What's interesting is that the Nanticoke, by the time John Smith uh, came up the Nanticoke River, uh, we had had so many negative engagements that our first response was kill him because there were Nanticoke that had been snatched and uh, taken from our people. Uh, and John Smith wound up leaving gifts in the little tribal community when the people had withdrawn into the forests. When we, weren't, we, were, we were either unsuccessful in getting our arrows to reach the ship or really only sent them as a warning, don't come closer. But he wound up staying the night in the middle of the river, came ashore, left gifts, and the next morning, because he had left gifts, trade began, and a relationship began with the Jamestown colony. 90%, uh, and actually there are some that make it as high as 95% of our people, both Nanticoke and Lenape, died within the first century and a half, two centuries of contact because of disease and war. Uh, the population was absolutely decimated, and many of the diseases affected the most vulnerable portions of the population, the very young and the very old, which has a, a devastating impact on the transmission of culture. By the time that the new immigrants were established and emboldened, uh, they began to take over our lands, uh, tell us how we had to live, and began to determine that the land was always there because of something called doctrine of discovery. Next slide. Okay. Now we'll escape for a minute. Okay. Maybe we will escape. Well, as you figure out, well, as you figure out about the slide. Yeah.
as we're looking for that, I'll keep talking. The Doctrine of Discovery was established over a series of papables beginning in the 13th century and continuing to the 15th century. And essentially, it declared that non-Christian lands could be claimed by Christian kings, essentially, and that the people of those lands could also be claimed, and if they uh, refused, they could be subjugated, enslaved, their land seized, and they could be uh, destroyed. The doctrine was the key thought uh, that people had as they came in the conquest of, of the Americas. And because it was a doctrine that originated in the Roman Catholic Church, it was viewed as a Christian doctrine. It is not, but it was viewed as a Christian doctrine. And the, the notion of, of Christian and European became so intertwined with one another that what you have is, is American Indians calling all Europeans Christian, and Europeans, all Europeans referring to themselves as Christian, differentiating them from the wild Indians. Now this is significant because wild Indian referred to anyone who had not been uh, assimilated, Christianized. Interestingly enough, the non-wild Indian wound up having their identity changed, which we'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide, please. This doctrine of discovery is not just something that affected the colonial era and now it no longer has any sway. Uh, the doctrine of discovery is like a huge cloud that lingers over the entire United States. And there are some that are not affected negatively by it personally, and there are some that are still affected in devastating ways, but everyone is affected in one way or another. And those that do, are not affected negatively are at least affected because of their ignorance and the perpetuation of the wickedness started by the doctrine. It wound up actually becoming part of American Indian, a federal American Indian policy and law. There are three key Supreme Court decisions that actually discuss this issue, making it something that the United States wound up basing its Indian policy on. In addition to that, we know that not only were these decisions uh, you, uh, uh, used to prop up the doctrine of discovery as something that was de facto a part of American Indian policy and law, but even as recently as the last five or six years, today's Supreme Court utilized it in recent decisions, essentially saying that American Indians didn't have certain rights because of the doctrine of discovery, which is part of the reason that the uh, that committee was pulled together, that commission between North and South, Central America, seeking to have uh, Pope Francis uh, eradicate and withdraw those papal bulls. Next slide, please. The impact of discovery and colonization was that by the end of the 17th century, we were scattered to the winds. Uh, during the early time period, our people went welcoming to being placed on reservations. A lot of people don't know that the earliest reservations were not out west, they were right here in the east. And some of the very first reservations were in this very area. Uh, in the Delmarva Peninsula in the late 1600s, there was reservations set up for my ancestors. And in New Jersey in the mid 1700s, there was a reservation set up. And there were unofficial Indian towns that were established by practice, if not, even, if not by local colonial law that dotted the landscape. Many of these communities continue today. The one that we hail from is one of those spots. Some of the folks that did not maintain their uh, place on the reservation wound up being forced to migrate. And they were pushed out of the region from Delaware, from New Jersey, from New York, through Pennsylvania. Some wound up as far out as Oklahoma. There are uh, tribal communities in Oklahoma. And because of the nature of that migration being continued under the federal government, under the Department of War, uh, with an agency that wound up becoming the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they wound up being enumerated. They were wards of the federal government, and they are federally recognized. Those of us that stayed in the East that were not under the auspices of the Department of War, we did not make war. We were staying right where we were wound up going unnoticed, by and large, for quite some time. Uh, the, those that remain wound up coalescing into small tribal communities. And those communities uh, maintained their identity by knowing where 
the other communities were. And those that migrated early on remembered that we were here. For example, up in Canada, uh, there are those that called us the keepers of the land. And when some of the people from my tribe visited some of the people up there, their elders wept because they were seeing the keepers of the land, the ones that maintained the land that they had been forced to leave. The misidentification of those of us that remained began to occur because we were no longer considered, considered wild Indians. We weren't, uh, and this was a legal definition, by the way, in Delaware during the colonial era, an, an Indian was someone who lived in the woods, ate primarily deer meat, and was not a Christian. So if that same person was baptized to Christianity, lived in a house made from bricks or, or you know, a log cabin, and like chicken or pork, and no longer was hunting for deer meat and wore uh, colonial style clothing, they were no longer classified legally as an Indian. There are actually ancestors that we have seen on uh, in certain colonial records that are an Indian one minute and mulatto the next, simply because of baptism. Uh, there are those that are classified as uh, free persons of color. And, our, and that meant anybody who wasn't white. And if they weren't Indian living in accordance with that legal definition, they actually had a racial change. This is a form of administrative genocide, the reassigning of race. Uh, please, next slide. Remaining in our area are several tribal communities that are identifiable historically. And what I mean by that is we can trace their origins back at least a hundred years or more. Uh, and in the northern part of New Jersey, the Ramapo Lenape Nation uh, actually straddles the line between northern New Jersey and New York. Uh, they are up there in the mountains. And um, uh, I, I think they're, they're, they're comprised on either side of about 4,000 of tribal citizens. They have their own government that they have maintained, uh, elected chiefs and sub-chiefs, and uh, we, we do fellowship with them. Uh, a little further south are the Sand Hill Indians. Now these folks are a blend of Cherokee and Lenape. Some Cherokee folk were in the great region, married in to some Lenape families that stayed. Uh, there are uh, several family lines that have maintain connection to this little area called Sand Hill. Um, and we acknowledge them as uh, in, an indigenous community. There is uh, some question as to whether they still have a formal tribal government. And I, I would have to contact them to find out. I know that they have maintained their identity and that they actually have a historical society and they have, uh, an online museum. And they are some wonderful people and are very much aware of their culture and their history. The uh, Powhatan Renape Nation, these are folks that came up from Virginia, the Powhatan tribes of Virginia. Many of them are Rappahannock um, and uh, Pamunkey, and their families moved up middle of the 1800s by and large, intermarried with the Lenape that still remained in the, in the region. Many of them intermarried with our people, and the names actually are Nanticoke Lenape names, uh, uh, one of the gentlemen that actually helps to uh, coordinate their leadership is the Nanticoke Indian, um, whose, whose family also hails from Virginia. One side of his family is the Virginia Indians, and the other side is, is Nanticoke. They moved up into the area around Morrisville and Pensauk and right across uh, the river from Philadelphia and stayed there. Uh, in the south, we have the Nanticoke Lenape Lenape Tribal Nation, that is my nation in the area of Cumberland County, uh, and the Lenape Indian Tribe of Delaware and the Nanticoke Indian Tribe of Delaware are both further south. One is in Kent County, one is in Sussex County, and they have been there since colonial times, just like we have. And the, the last three tribes that you see are the same folks, same families, intermarried for generations, and are documented well back into, I think we are, we've been able to document our genealogy back 
uh, to the 1500s in those areas. So uh, we've, been, we've been there, according to our own tradition, for thousands of years and documented since the early days of contact. Next slide, please. Now, those three communities that I spoke to you about, uh, the Nanticoke Line of Lenape in southern New Jersey, the Lenape Indian tribe in the area around Dover, Delaware, a little town called Cheswold, and the Nanticoke Indian tribe in southern Delaware, Sussex County, in, headquartered around the Indian River in a town called Millsboro, uh, are in a confederation. And there's an intertribal union of the three governments where our chiefs, come together when we speak and deal with international affairs, dealing with the federal government of the United States, dealing with other governments, where we speak with a single voice. Over local matters, each tribe has its own leadership and government, and they deal with their own situation. Uh, interestingly enough, among those tribes, everybody's interrelated. And part of the reason was, for about 150 years, marriages that were deemed to be acceptable by the tribal elders were marriages between the three tribes. And so each of the gentlemen you see there is a distant relative of the other, and I'm related to all three of them. You really can't shake a stick without hitting a cousin. As a matter of fact, the lines are so intertwined, we invented new languages. We have double and triple cousins uh, because of the way that the lines have continued to intertwine. Next slide, please. Now, our three communities uh, are historically interrelated and self-governing. There's always been some form of self-governance even after the breakup of the traditional chieftaincies uh, that the community stayed together and continued to govern themselves uh, on the Delmarva and in southern New Jersey. And the families that made up those communities have been studied for centuries by anthropologists, have been documented by both the local and federal government, and in fact have even been studied by international scholars. Enrolled citizens in each of our, of our tribes have to meet rather stringent standards. You can't just simply say, I think I'm Indian, can I be a member? Uh, you, you know, we're, we, we have become more open within the past uh, 20, 30 years or so where we are welcoming of uh, non-Indian friends and volunteers to actually get close to the community, to work with the community, to come among us. Um, and that's a new move because prior to that we had reason to be afraid of that uh, because it tended to wind up causing rather disastrous things happening to our people. But in order to be a citizen with the tribe, you have to be able to document your descent from our core tribal families. You've got to be related to the specific families that have continued in these regions uh, from time immemorial, and you have to have a close blood relationship. What we call blood quantum a measure has to be met in order for you to enroll as a tribal citizen. The issue of the blood quantum requirement is something that was placed upon us. It's not a standard that American Indians ever used traditionally. It's something that was put on us by uh, the United States government, this measure of you know, full bloods, quarter bloods, half bloods. And uh, now today we are no longer mandated by the U.S. to use that measure, but it's one of the ways that we are able to uh, bolster our identity when we are called into question by people who tend to call every Indian into question and require every Indian to prove who he, who he or she happens to be. Next, next slide. One of the things that's very important to our people is that we try to keep our people together. Uh, that scattering to the winds means that we no longer will be a people. We are the remnant that remained. The few that stayed, that continued to live on the land, to, to watch over the bones of our ancestors. And from the 1600s, Nanticokes began to come, come up further for the, the little communities that were coalescing uh, for survival purposes, forming little Indian towns, um, and intermarried with the remaining Lenape, south, south, southern, excuse me, central Delaware and southern New Jersey. And thereby we have this uh, interconnection between the Nanticoke and the Lenape uh, from around the Delaware Bay. And 
in southern New Jersey, it's interesting, you know, I'm here at a Quaker retreat center. I always like to, to kind of celebrate this fact. One of the things that our elders remind us about is that if it weren't for the Quakers in southern New Jersey, we may not have been able to stay in southern New Jersey. Very early on, uh, as the Quaker communities came in uh, and the, the British wound up taking over the region because we had had uh, dealings with the Swedes and with the Dutch prior to the British, when the British came in and the Quakers began to establish uh, their presence in the region, the southern part of New Jersey was dominated by Quakers. And uh, there were areas that were left untouched called Indian fields where our people continued to live in the old way. Um, and for the most part were left alone. And in those areas in Cumberland County, you find the same families even today, making up the core families of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape from Southern New Jersey. And for many generations in Delaware, our people were segregated. Uh, and we had our own churches, even in Southern New Jersey, we had our own church, or have our own church. And uh, we had our own social events. We had our own schools started right from the tribal communities. Next slide, please. These are the core churches of each of the tribal communities of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape people. Uh, in the, the, the one up at the top is the Indian Mission Church among the Nanticoke way down in Millsboro, Delaware. And it is the congregation that has maintained its connection to the tribal community as a core tribal church where the tribal government itself was in the church for many, many years, for generations, before coming out and separately forming uh, under a constitutional form of government with bylaws and elected leaders. And the leaders of the church were the leaders of the tribe. The same thing in central Delaware, in the area of Cheswold with the Emanuel Union Church. It was another church established by our people, for our people, interesting story. There is a newspaper article from 1892 where one of our elders is quite proudly indicating that we welcome anybody to visit, but you can't join unless you're one of our people. And the reason was not because they didn't like other folks, but that's where the tribal government was. And if you could join, you could vote. And if you could vote, you would influence the tribal government decisions so that the government and the church were the same thing. In uh, southern New Jersey, the St. John's United Methodist Church, all of these churches, by the way, are United Methodist today, uh, is the same, very similar history um, in southern New Jersey. Each of these churches has been designated by the United Methodist Church as, as historic American Indian congregations. And they wound up undergoing uh, the, the, the one in Millsboro and the one in New Jersey, there were church splits because of demographic shifts in communities and demographic shifts in the church where non-Indians were becoming pro prominent portions of the membership. Churches wound up splitting because that was where the, in, where, where the tribal government was. Um, that's not the case anymore. The tribal governments for each of the, each of the uh, communities is we have elected councils. Um, but in that day, church leadership was tribal leadership. Next slide. And by the way, that was very common up and down the East Coast. Uh, I've been up and down to several tribes, and you will find that just about all of them have some core church that kept them together for about 150 years when it was just about 